Okay, class, um, here is our second class, and this will substitute for Friday's class. Uh, I want to go over a few announcements uh, for things for class. Hopefully everything should still be on track <coughs> with the syllabus, so keep up with the reading. Hopefully everybody's safe uh, and sound, and um, hopefully the university will get everything fixed. But regardless, um, go uh, make sure you do the reading. Um, the reading for this week <coughs> is the ISSP article looking at environmental concern and values um, around the world. Um, the ISSP is limited to about 40 nations, but it's expanding as it goes. But before we get to any of that, like I said, make sure to read first. Before I get to any of that, uh, a few announcements. Uh, reading for Monday is on Blackboard, so everything is uh, normal as, as um, we can get here. Essay experiment is due tomorrow. Um, I'll give you all day for that. Uh, the chapter survey, uh, which again, we will, I will have you read uh, a chapter out of um, this new book called My Sociology Pro or The Sociology Project out of NYU. <clears throat> have you do some short survey. I'll also have you do a few more surveys as far as um, opinion for the class. So watch out for that on your email. And then make sure to look. Um, so the chapter survey will do, be due November 9th. And then look over the second test. Um, and bring in questions on Monday and then you can email me as well if you're having any issues. Make sure you start early on the survey um, portion of the test um, and explain what you're doing there as well. We will get more into issues with survey data um, and designing questions and some of the issues that are surrounding that later. Uh, this probably won't take the whole 65 minutes so we'll see uh, but again um, I will also maybe do this as well for, the, for some review elements of the test uh, but we'll see how that goes. Hopefully, if class gets started again on November 5th, it, um, uh, it shouldn't be a problem. Um, they will probably most likely try to extend <clears throat> the semester past um, the final exam that they have currently scheduled. Uh, but if we get everything still on schedule, uh, we won't have to do that. Uh, as well, take into account that also the university, while they ha are having issues with the power, also just uh, released news that said that the athletics program will not be participating in postseason play, making the game against Mount Union uh, a lot less significant um, and really some unspecified uh, issues regarding that. So we'll talk about that more when we get back from class. <clears throat> but let's turn to our uh, continuing examination of survey data and how it can be used and uh, how, what theories surround some of this stuff. Now with the ISSP, there's actually a whole set of theories that were developed once the ISSP was completed and it has been gone through several different time frames. Um, and one of them, one of the major theories that it's designed that you read about uh, is by Ronald Englehart and it's called post-materialism or the post-materialist values. And what he did, he initially analyzed the data and found that wealthier core nations uh, tended to have different value systems than ones that were in the developing world, meaning had lower levels per capita income. And that meant when it came to the importance of education or environmental values, uh, a whole set of issues, uh, human rights, health care, uh, that, that matches with the social democratic um, governments and economic systems in Europe that provide a lot of social welfare. But again, one of the issues here mainly in this article are environmental values and the connection between uh, people's personal and, and physical well-being and their uh, wealth and uh, monetary comfort and what they're willing to pay for and be taxed for when it comes to environmental protection or what they're willing to tolerate. And it becomes not only an issue of wealth and um, um, modern values, um, but it becomes uh, an issue of uh, how people want their standard of living to be, uh, what legacy they want to leave for their future generations and for history. So we're going to look at a few things here. <clears throat> now, when I put the camera on the board, it's going to be hard to see me, so it's not going to be a problem. Then I'm going to move, I'll, I'll turn the camera off a couple times and put some more things up on the board. And then we'll move to talk about some of the things on in the article itself and I'll put up a highlighted version of the article on Blackboard and I'll read some of the elements here and again this probably won't take <clears throat> the whole class period that it normally would. So let's go over a few things here. So here are some of the beginning concepts here. So obviously the, this is the International Social uh, um, Survey Project um, and it, we're looking at environmental values, it looks at religion and a whole host of things similar to the GSS. Now, what, what um, Englehart is talking about 
post-materialist values versus materialist values is this concept uh, related similarly to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, whereas when you're struggling to eat or find shelter or have a job or have any kind of personal rights or human rights or dignity, it's very difficult to concentrate on other things that may be seemingly outside of your own personal life, like concepts of global warming or environmental protection or other human rights or whatever it is. that. People, when they're beginning in stages of developing in a nation or as individuals, are focused more on material goods. Do I have enough money to pay the rent? Do I have enough food? Do I have shelter? Do I have these things not only now but for later? And then when people feel more comfortable, potentially they start to develop what are called post-materialist values, values that are also post-industrial, that there's more to life than just earning money or getting possessions or having a house. And it's more focused on standard of living, not simply wealth. And it comes down to the prioritization of non-material experiences over money and wealth. And also quality of life issues like being able to breathe the air. Uh, and you'll see it uh, if you look at um, documentaries on China. There's one called Inside China, uh, and it talks about the environment. And they are right now in a battle for whether or not they're going to support environmental values and policies or whether economic issues are going to trump over top of that, and they're trying a very difficult balance, and right now the air and the water are very are suffering, um, very much like what was occurring in this country throughout the ninth, late 19th and early 20th century, um, and even still to this day, as you see some of the issues of global warming uh, related to the storm. So I'm going to turn the camera off, and I'm going to put a few things on here, how to break down this article, and work, what pages to get certain information and, on theories and explanations. Then I'm going to go over the charts. Uh, and read some of the aspects out of the article that I think are important. Go over the charts and then go over the discussion and conclusion. And that will be it for today. And then we will, uh, you can talk to me on email um, about the test or about the, the article itself. So just give me one second. Okay. For this segment, you're not going to be able to really see me, but I want to focus on the board here. These are page numbers. This says page 2. This is 2.3. This is deep mint. You can get this on the bottom of page 3. I'll reference the article here in a little bit, and I'll read a part of it uh, and interpret this, uh, what, the, what it's saying here. Um, but <clears throat> before we get to some of these things, and this is how you can break down any kind of article. I didn't put it into methods, and then we'll talk about the discussion and conclusion afterwards because I'll erase this and put more information on it. But in any study or survey, there's certain things you want to know, especially with a survey. One who's doing it and why they're doing it. So that's one of this issue question. And you want some issue, some concern, either because it's increasing or it's important or it's impacting a large amount of people or it's just interesting. So you have this here with this article explaining the rise of environmental values and also more importantly the variation in environmental values using both micro and macro factors, meaning what impact does a country's overall level of wealth versus somebody's individual level of wealth. And all those things different. <clears throat> Secondarily, what's not on here, you want to look at what, how many cases um, somebody's using in their study, especially if it's a survey data. Um, how did they collect the data? Was it a phone? Was it a mail survey? Was it online? Uh, what's their margin of error? Uh, what did the questions look like? What were the options for the question? Was it anonymous? Was it not? Was it randomly collected? What analysis are the people using? What other variables? What other data sets do they get? What data set are they using itself? Is it the ISSP? Is it the census? Is it mixed data? Um, and then obviously things like what theories you want to look at. So on and on. And we'll talk about that as we go along and we get closer to the due date um, for the second test. <clears throat> but back to the article we were looking at uh, for today. Here is obviously the issue I discussed here. Explaining the rise of environmental values, or at least the existence of it, on an international global level. So here what we're trying to look at is, why do certain countries have higher levels of concern for the environment over others? <clears throat> and in the beginning of the article, um, in, the, in the introduction as well as on page two, they talk about the origins of environmental values, um, uh, what it means. Uh, they talk about how they measured it, and one of the issues here is how they measured it is they asked people their willingness to pay more taxes to protect the environment or to have uh, environment, or an economic growth go down and protect certain elements of the environment. There are obviously some major issues with that. 
one, they didn't ask about specific environmental issues like land uh, pollution versus water versus air versus global warming, um, you know, or storms caused by global warming, or whatever it is. So there are issues there, but still, it's still a good measure. You have to make these decisions. You have to operate, this is what's called operationalizing this. You have to make a decision that we're going to go with this variable, <clears throat> and we're going to go with these theories, and we're going to go with this data, and we're going to see what it says, and if someone wants to challenge it, that's fine. But one of the things you want to do is make sure that you use multiple theories, multiple data, uh, and it makes it less likely that someone is going to attack your work. So see that on page two. The data here is the ISSP environmental module from 1993 to 2000, and, and 2000, not to 2000, and 2000. And why they do that is they want to see what happened over time. And we'll, I'll show you that in chart one. Theories and hypotheses, this is on page two and three, and I'll get to that here in a second. Um, the three main theories here are one by Engelhardt that's older from the 80s and 90s, post-materialist values. I talked about that in a minute, or earlier, I mean. Uh, B, the second theory here, a new global paradigm that was uh, suggested by Dunlap. It's really a cultural theory. Um, it doesn't necessarily have a name uh, other than this new global paradigm. And he suggests that environmental values are on the rise because of globalization and the global uh, spread of media, as well as value systems around the world, people traveling around. And his proof is that he sees that even third world nations have high levels of environmental values and policies. But is that really what's going on? And then the last theory, which is Diekman and seems to be supported by the author as well, is called prosperity theory. And that's the suggestion that um, part of why this is occurring, or even why this is occurring, is related to the power of Earth's prosperity of a nation itself as well as individuals. That as a nation becomes wealthier and all of its basic physical needs are taken care of and there's luxury and things left over, that they're willing to use that extra money they have, the wealth they have, either as individuals or nation, uh, to clean up either messes and things that they did in the past for environmental, <clears throat> for industrial development, I mean, um, and then also the sense of uh, protecting themselves from the future that if you're wealthy or you live in a wealthy nation, it's a shame to have filthy water or filthy air. And uh, just as much as people, you know, say that you can't buy um, or put a price on health, it's similar here with environmental damage. Most people feel that they're willing to spend an enormous amount of money, even if it means cutting back on things, if they can protect the environment. So, so here's, here are the theories. Um, again, this is one that's an older one. And they test each one of these theories. And I'll show you exactly how they do that by looking at the charts. I want to go over and read some of the stuff about the theories themselves before we move on. And I want to put back up on top here uh, some more writing uh, about some of the discussions about what they found uh, and the evidence in the charts. So I'm going to turn the camera off for a second. I'm going to redo this. And I'm going to show you some of the stuff in the article uh, and read it uh, to you. Some of the look over the charts and then uh, look at which theories that the authors found using the evidence uh, that they feel was the most correct. So, Okay, as you can see I've changed the, um, the whiteboard here. And um, a couple other aspects of breaking down these articles. Um, normally within these articles there's comparing and contrasting of the theories. Uh, and you can see that on page 4 and 5. Where there's a discussion of where these theories come from, <clears throat> what previous evidence has been done uh, that is similar to the article, but yet uh, um, suggests that more research needs to be done. There's usually some kind of argument here, one way or the other, that, look, it's post-materialism, and it's when countries are wealthy and grow wealthy enough to afford environmental values, <clears throat> that's when you see them grow among the general population, and uh, also among policymakers as well. And then you have, uh, as well, then the analysis itself through the methods section where they describe the variables and how many cases and what they use for variables um, uh, to measure the micro and macro factors. And then the charts and the tables. And the first one looked at mean levels of environmental values. <clears throat> and then the second one looked at more specific correlations, meaning putting them into a mathematical model and looking at what correlates the macro factors, meaning uh, country level variables and individual level variables, which you can do on the ISSP. 
because you can both analyze the individual respondents and their responses, and you can analyze the overall aggregate responses from each country. For example, that um, Germany has 45% of the people say that we're willing to be taxed um, for environmental protection, or Japan has 38%. You can see why that is. So you can put other country level variables in there. <coughs> I'll talk about each one of those things here in a minute. And then the conclusion and discussion usually is an analysis uh, of the results themselves and what they mean for each theory and, and then which theory was correct or are there certain elements of one theory that are correct in certain situations and another theory in other situations and that's on pages 9 and 10. So what I want to do now, and I'm going to move the camera over a little bit, so I'm going to have to turn it off again. <clears throat> and then I'm going to point it at um, the screen here, the computer screen, and you, you won't be able to read the, um, what I'm reading, but again, I'll tell you what page it's on, uh, and then I'll go through the analysis. Hopefully you can sort of see it through the camera. I will try and uh, push the camera up against the screen as much as possible. I'm going to either try and get a projector for the next time I do this or put it on my television. Right now I just, uh, I'm not sure how that would come across on the camera. So I'm going to turn the camera off for a second and then we're going to talk about the article a little bit. We're going to talk about the charts and then we're going to talk about the discussion, the conclusion and then that'll be it for today and then I'll see you on Monday. Okay, so now we're back and let's go over this article sure we can see it here. Just the camera. Okay, so this is the beginning part I was talking about. Go back up here to page two. It's actually technically 220. Okay, and this was done by Franzen and Meyer. These are the authors. And we'll talk about their theory as well. But it goes on to say here. I'm just trying to move it that way so I can read it. Anyway, I hope everybody can see that out there. But again, this is on page two. <clears throat> and it goes on to talk about some of the origins um, of the question and the paper itself. So the authors go on to say here, however, explaining the individual and cross-national differences, meaning in environmental values, is still a controversial issue in environmental research. On one hand, some authors, most prominently Ronald Engelhart, uh, and they list one of his papers in 1995, have argued that citizens of wealthier nations display more pro-environmental attitudes because of a general shift from materialistic to most post-materialistic values, and that goes back to what we were just saying there, in modern societies, and then goes on to talk about a competing theory by Dunlop and Mertig in 1997. On the other hand, we opposed this view and argued that environmental concern is even higher in poorer nations, a finding which has lately become be, to be uh, been reconfirmed uh, by Gellison in 2007, still others, Diekman and Franzen, who is one of the authors of this paper, and Franzen in 2003 found that wealth and environmental concern are positively associated, but that the wealth effect is not necessarily dependent on a fundamental value transformation, as argued by Engelhardt. So they're saying here that wealth is connected, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a change in people's value systems. It's just that they can more afford things that they think they should do, and it's not necessarily a shift. Whereas the original post-materialist post value was suggesting that people's fundamental values were changed. Um, <clears throat> and that's why they were supporting environmental values. That yes, poverty, prosperity had something to do with it, but it's because it satisfied the physical needs they had so that they could move on to look at more um, ethereal or post-material things. Whereas Dunlap's um, main argument here was that people in poorer nations would be have higher levels of environmental concern, partly partly the spread of values globally, but partly because they see the damage. Someone in China who lives near a dump, or, uh, um, or someone in Mexico who lives in a shanty town with no sewer, that these things are much more important from a personal perspective, whereas many people in core nations don't have these um, pressing issues, although if you look at the storm, clearly things like global warming could be considered to be a pressing issue. And this article, unfortunately, uh, and the ISSP um, don't deal necessarily direct, as directly with specific issues of environmental concern, which is an issue in and of itself. But again, so to go on, and then the, art, the authors uh, say this, the paper has a three, two-fold purpose. We first compare the level of environmental attitudes as well as its development in the nations that participated in the International Social Survey Program in 1993 and in 2000. So two separate time periods, not 
93, 94, 95, 96, just to 1993, and then seven years later they did this environmental module. <clears throat> Second, we analyzed the ISSP by applying multi-level models to the data in order to explain the individual as well as the country level differences. Next to the World Value Survey, which is related to the ISSP, uh, but is quite different. In the Health of the Planet study, the ISSP is one of <clears throat> three available data sources that permits cross-national comparison. So they're saying here, this is why we chose this database. They probably should have used data as well from these other databases, but sometimes it's, it's difficult to do, and it doesn't necessarily fit with what you're trying to analyze, because maybe one of these surveys doesn't have all the data. But you tend to want to use mixed, not only mixed theories, but mixed methods, meaning quantitative and qualitative, but also mixed data sets. Uh, if it's possible, and they're saying as well here why some of the reasons why uh, they're using ISSP. But it goes on to say here, however, um, and it says all of these data sources have already been analyzed. However, most existing studies are either restricted to the macro level, Engelhardt's study, Dunlop, and then Franzen's own study earlier, or to the individual level, and they mention here uh, an example, but did not take the multi-level nature of the data into account. The restriction to the macro level bears the danger of committing an ecological fallacy. Thus, the wealth of nations, a macro variable, might be related to a country's mean level of environmental concern. However, the correlation could be due to some other influences besides wealth, meaning they say, look, it could be the false correlation, that it's just happenstance that countries that have high levels of wealth in and of themselves have high levels of environmental concern when underneath the surface something like an individual variable like education or personal wealth might have more to do with it, whereas people who are highly educated and have high levels of personal wealth or maybe live in environmentally degraded areas have higher levels of environmental concern than the average person in the study. And therefore, not only do we need to look at the aggregate total totals for the ISSP for each country, meaning how much environmental concern Japan has versus Germany, but within Japan and Germany, why some people in Japan or Germany have higher levels than their own countrymen. So, so it goes on here to say, however, the correlation could be due to other restriction to the individual level, on the other hand, leaves out other potentially important determinants such as the nation's environmental quality, its distribution of wealth, or its population density. So they're saying, look, we need both micro, macro variables, micro, macro theories. Our analysis shows, our analyses shows that cross-national as well as between individual differences in environmental concern are clearly related to wealth and income respectively, which lends strong support to the prosperity hypothesis meaning that not only the wealth of a nation, but the wealth of individuals impacts people's environmental concerns. So it goes on to say, and then, and then they move to talking. They go up here and continue with this. Um, and they talk about the, the structure of the paper. Then they go on in this section here to talk about the literature review and how environmental concern has been discussed in the past. And it says here, environmental concern is defined as the awareness or insight of individuals that the natural state of the environment is threatened through resource overuse and pollution by humans. And, and that is by Dunlap, which is one of the authors of the oppositional theory to Engelhardt. So it goes on to talk about the micro elements. <clears throat> individuals differ with respect to their concern for the environment, and there are at least three hypotheses trying to explain this variation. So not only are they telling you a little bit of how they're defining environmental concern, they're looking at these three hypotheses and theories, and also looking at who's behind them, what past studies have said about each one of these theories, and how they are going to go about testing these theories with the available data that they're using. So it goes on to talk about Engelhardt, the post-materialist hypothesis, Dunlop hypothesis, that environmental concern is spread globally, and finally, the prosperity or affluence hypothesis, which has its origin in classical economic reasoning, and has lately been confirmed by Diekman and Franzen. According to Engelhardt, environmental awareness is a part of a general change and fundamental values that will take place as societies develop. As societies become more affluent, their members are less preoccupied with the economic struggle for survival and are free to pursue what Engelhardt termed post-materialistic goals such as political freedom, individual fulfillment, and environmental protection. And what's sort of lost in that theory here is the idea of why somebody that lives in a, a, a post-industrial, meaning a nation that became wealthy through industrial power and then now is more of a technologically service-based economy like the United States, would 
then turn it uh, focus and idea instead of searching for yourself for spiritualism to environmental values and the answer is because through industrialization damage is done to the environment and people become more aware of it as they become more developed and wealthier and more educated and they send their kids to school and they come back telling their parents that um, the river is polluted or the lake is polluted and somebody needs to do something about it and here's why it happens and that coal burning power plants do this type of damage so there's one element that they're missing through that, and that might be a little more explained through the cultural theory that Dunlap was talking about. But back here to the reading itself. So it goes on to say, what Englehart termed uh, post-materialist goals, such as political freedom, on and on. Englehart asserted that the shift from materialism to post-materialism is irreversible as long as material prosperity continues, which is not guaranteed as we've seen. So what he would suggest is during a severe recession or depression, environmental values would wane in the public eye and the public's idea of importance um, and in times of prosperity would become more important. And you certainly see that with the election. There's been very little discussion about environmental values or damage, although with the storm it's coming back a little bit. He used data from the World Value Survey to test a hypothesized positive correlation between prosperity and environmental concern. However, the data only partially supported his hypothesis since some of the, of the countries whose citizens displayed high levels of environmental concern were developing nations, meaning nations like India or Brazil or uh, uh, Nigeria or Kenya or Botswana. In response to this unexpected finding, Engelhart formulated his objective problems and subjective values hypothesis according to this. So he saw this data didn't exactly confirm his theory, so he tried to adjust it. <clears throat> and he goes on to say, according to this, members of wealthy societies take on pro-environmental attitudes in the process of adopting post-materialistic values in general. In other words, their environmental attitudes are not necessarily formed in response to immediate problems meaning environmental concerns. <clears throat> Citizens of poorer nations, on the other hand, are faced with pressing local environmental problems. So he's saying there's two different mechanisms. One, if you're in one of these developing countries, you have env strong environmental values because you feel that um, conditions warrant it because you live in a filthy environment or you are in, in a factory that pollutes the environment and you're aware of it. You're objectively concerned about it. Whereas in a cork nation where you don't see in environmental pollution every day uh, and maybe you see the, the forms of it in hurricanes and other storms but you see it more as a subjective thing of a quality of a life issue um, and that he said that these two different forces were working sort of at the same time and he goes on to say, thus environmental awareness can be a consequence of prosperity, albeit not a direct one, as it is mediated by a change from materialist to post-materialistic values. However, those in poorer nations also display high concern for the quality of the environment. Their concern stems from concrete and immediate local problems rather than from a shift to post-materialist values. Thus, Engelhart postulates two independent effects on environmental concern. So you can divide nations into wealthier nations and into poorer nations and use these two sets of hypotheses coming out of the same theory to explain why, some, why, why both of them have high levels of environmental concern, but for different reasons. And then so it goes on to talk about how Dunlap challenged it and Dunlap suggested specifically they argue that environmental concern exists in many third world countries as well as industrial countries, an assertion that is in line with earlier work on the development of a new ecological paradigm. Just as they argue that environmental concern is not limited to citizens of wealthy nations, they also claim it is not confined to the elites within those nations, but is um, instead spread to the general population. And inherent in this, and he tested this theory with the Health of the Planet survey, and inherent in this is the idea of the power of the media, particularly the Internet, and ideas spreading through what we call the social contagion theory. And even though this, that theory is not talked about, it's implied in here. The third approach, which is the third theory that they're testing, which is the one, though, that one of the authors supports, Franzen, who's written an article in support of this in 2003, says this. There is a third approach, which we will call the prosperity or affluence hypothesis. Following the arguments typically advanced in environmental economics, we assume that the quality of the environment is not only a public good, but also a good, uh, but also a good that demand for which rises with income. Furthermore, meaning that as people are able to afford it, they're willing to purchase it. The same way you would buy a luxury home. 
environmental um, values or environmental policies and impl implementation of those policies is a good, is a public and a private good. And we assume that individuals face a trade-off between consumption of goods and the quality of the environment. This kind of trade-off is usually depicted with the Engel curve as figure one. And what it's suggesting here is as uh, consumption goes up, the desire for committing re more resources uh, goes up as well. As income increases, budget constraints shift upwards, which allows both for an increase in consumption in general and a higher investment in environmental quality. And almost people feel guilty because of it. Englehart doesn't say this, but the more people buy things, I've heard some people go to the store and they buy so much stuff and they feel bad about all of it because it's plastic junk, that they go out and plant trees or pay to have trees planted, which by the way you can do. You can actually go on websites, and I'll get them for you later, where you can pay somebody to go plant a tree for you if you feel that you're using too much paper or something. Anyway. <clears throat> Thus, as a population becomes wealthier, the demand for environmental quality should rise, which in the aggregate should result in a positive correlation between a country's wealth and the level of environmental concern. So this is a macro theory, looking at the wealthier a country is as a whole, the more on a whole the population will have higher aggregate levels of environmental concern. More specifically, it is often argued that the relation between wealth and environmental concern is not linear, but concave, which means it's, it's curved linear. It's like this, that as wealth rises, environmental concern rises, and then it reaches an inflection point and starts to go down. And I'll show you this here in a second. It says, thus, as environmental quality improves with wealth, individuals' marginal willingness to play for environmental quality might decline again especially if they perceive the environment as being healthier because of the spending. So here this environmental Kuznets curve, that as wealth goes up, environmental concern goes up until you reach an inflection point and then it starts to go down. This is another way to look at it as well. This is the willingness to pay for environmental things. So this goes on to talk about the three distinct hypotheses. And you can read over this yourself. This is on page four and five. And so they look at each one of the variables they use and they put it into these uh, compare and contrast sections about mi micro and macro causes in the past studies. Uh, and again, um, for example, it says here specifically individuals living in more populous areas or larger cities might feel themselves to be confronted with environmental problems to a larger extent. And therefore, one of the factors that may be influencing people's environmental values is where they live. Do they live in a city? Do they live in a very densely populated city? What's going on in the city? You know, a river's catching on fire, like in Ohio and things like that. And they go on to say, to sum up, it is still an unresolved debate in environmental sociology how a nation's wealth as well as individual prosperity is related to environmental concern. While some studies assume and find positive associations, other studies deny them. So they're sitting up here. This is why we're doing this. The debate's not settled. There's these three theories out there that we have. There's this multitude of data. We're going to do the study. We're going to look at both macro and micro variables and test all the contentions of the past study. So it goes on to say, in addition, further country-specific variables such as the distribution of wealth or environmental quality has not been scrutinized in, cross na in, a, in a cross-national perspective so far. In what follows, we submit the prosperity and post-materialism hypotheses combined with other assumed determinants to an empirical test by applying multi-level models to the ISSP data of 93 and 2000. The ISSP has the advantage that it contains a comparatively thorough measurement of environmental attitudes and therefore does not rely on only one or two single indicators, as do other studies. Moreover, the particular participating nations of the ISSP are particularly concerned with random sampling procedures. There is an increase in validity. And further, reliable data are also available for the country's other characteristics. GNP, environmental quality, uh, uh, needed, you know, other variables needed for the analysis. Now, let's go to the chart to see what they found out. So here's the methodology section, which I didn't require you to read. Here is table one. And what this shows you here is the, uh, a couple things. Here's the nation, and here's the abbreviation for each nation. Here's mean environmental concern in 2000. Get bigger here. 
Here's the mean environmental concern for 1993, so you can see how things have either gone up or gone down over time. Here is the sample size, so it tells you how many people they interviewed in this particular, uh, in 2000. And then this shows you, this is price parity uh, uh, measure, uh, meaning that th this is taking into account that the dollar, that dollar bills or currency in one country is worth different, and so they try to standardize this, and this is essentially GDP. Um, in thousands of dollars, and then here's percentage difference of real GDP per capita. So how much did real GDP per capita grow from 1993 to 2000 in these countries? And that way you can look at if a country, one of the theories is that prosperity and wealth is related, so a country that has a high level here should have saw an increase in environmental values from 93 to 2000. So for example, It's hard to see any of them that really have increased from 93 to 2000. They've actually sort of, most of them have gone down. Uh, and that's a, a serious issue. And it's a blow to the theory as well. As you see, I mean, some went marginally up. Most of them went down. Uh, and it doesn't matter about the GDP. Uh, one of the things you do see, though, is a high level of environmental values in general. One of the things you don't see, though, is an increase from 93 to, two, uh, from to 2000. Almost none of them have increased. All right, let's go on to the next chart. This one is a little more important here. This one is environmental concern in the United States, Japan, and Germany. And they're looking again from these two time periods, 93 and 2000. And what you would want, or what you might expect, uh, since GDP per capita went up in all these, in both, in all three of these countries, is that environmental values from 2000 should be higher than 1993 if the prosperity theory is correct, or even the post-materialism. Uh, is correct. If the, however, the cultural global one is correct, then you would either see no increase or a slight increase uh, in certain aspects. So this is asking how willing would you be to pay much higher taxes in order to protect the environment. And the, this is percentage of very and fairly willing. And you see in the United States it's actually gone down. In Japan it stayed the same. And in Germany it went down. The second question, how willing would you be to pay much higher taxes in order to protect the environment? And this is, again, has gone down in both these nations. How willing would you be to accept cuts in your standard of living in order to protect your environment? It's gone down quite significantly in Germany. Um, so again, it's calling into question this idea as wealth is going up, that people be more willing to pay for, um, then that's the prosperity effect. And this, this is another question. I do what is right for the environment even when it costs more money or takes more time, for example, recycling or buying environmentally responsible products. And this has gone down again in all three countries. You see as well general questions about science. Um, these are anti-environmentalist uh, or, or anti-environmental value questions um, and basically most of these have stayed the same as well over time or have gone down slightly. This one, people worry too much about human progress harming the environment. It actually went up in Japan and went down in Germany and went down in the United States. Here are some more questions on this chart here. Almost everything we do in modern life harms the environment. So this is sort of a question that's asking, is the system and how we live itself in harming the environment? And it's gone down in the United States, one percentage point in Japan, and then seven percentage points in Germany. And this says economic growth always harms the environment. And look at, look at one of the differences here that's interesting. Look at the United States, it's only 20%. And in Japan, it was 60% in, in 1993 or in 2000. No, wait, that's 1993, sorry. Uh, and then in Germany as well, it's much, much higher than the United States. So in between the countries, there's major differences. But in general, uh, um, you see these things go down. And in Japan, it really went down. This shows you again on this chart. Here's the number of cases. Here's the mean index for environmental concern. Here's the standard deviations, some other statistics that, pe that people uh, put in there. Here's the chart here as well. And you see the United States, even it should be up here according to the regression line and, and must have a much higher level of environmental concern for the high level of GDP it has. Um, you also see PT. Let me see which country. Portugal is a bit of an outlier in that it has a high level of GDP but a low level of environmental concern. And Mexico, on the other hand, has a low GDP but a high, high level of environmental concern. And that might be partly due to the Maquiadora factories that are polluting the environment down by the border.
All right. One last chart here. <clears throat> And I'm not going to read all the results here, and I'll get to the other chart here in a second, but I do want to read this right here. It says, the results indicate that for every additional preference of a post-materialist goal, environmental awareness increases by almost one unit on our concern index. Furthermore, we find that women have much higher levels of environmental concern and that environmentalism declines with age. In addition, the model indicates a measure of individuals uh, environmental knowledge and a measure of individual's subjective perception of environmental quality. Not surprisingly, the more individuals know about the environment, so here's the element of education, and, and specifically environmental education, the higher their concern. This effect is relatively strong, but does not eliminate the effect of the general level of education. The subjective perception of the condition of the local environment condition also affects environmental concern. The worse the perceived quality of the environment, the higher the environmental concern. And that affirms Engelhardt's idea of both the objective and the subjective measures that people are concerned about the environment. Wealthy people are concerned because they're concerned about the overall quality of life and they're well-educated and they know about it and they see the threat. And other individuals in countries like Mexico are aware of it because they live in it every day. And they see the sewers and they see the chemicals that they live in. And I bet people on the East Coast are seeing the effect of global warming and they're not going to forget this anytime soon now that it's personally affected them. Um, and many people are concerned that the storm was related to that. <clears throat> it goes on to say, the worse the perceived quality of the environment, the higher environmental concern. Again, both effects are rather similar to the different models and can thus be considered robust findings. So there's proof that Engelhardt's ideas are somewhat correct. Models 2 and 4 differ from models 1 and 3 in that they test for nonlinearity and interaction effects between micro and macro level variables. According to the results of this analysis, the effect of individual income is not linear but concave as environmental concern increases to a marginally declining degree with income. In contrast, the effects of post-materialist values and education are convex. The marginal increase in environmental concerns increases at higher levels of post-materialistic value orientations. However, the results hold only for the ISSP 2000 data and not for 1993, which means something fundamentally was different in how people were concerned about the environment potentially in 1993. And that's one of the fascinating things about looking at two time periods. <clears throat> It goes on, the shape of the effect of education differs between the two data sets. In the ISSP 1993, education has an exponential effect on environmental concern. I'll go over this chart here in a second. In the ISSP 2000, concern first decreases with education until respondents reach on average 4.5 years of education, after which additional education increases environmental concern. However, since the results differ between the two surveys, its functional form should not be overinterpreted. We also tested for a number of possible cross-level effects and obtained one statistically significant result. The positive effect of post-material values becomes stronger the richer the country of the respondents. So there's an interaction effect here, that the more educated people are, and if they're in a wealthy country, the higher the level of environmental concern. So now we're getting at the nuances that are driving environmental concern. So let's go back to this chart here. Let me zoom out a little bit here. And this one is broken up into country level variables, and this is using all the countries from 93 and 2000. And you see here's 93, there's 93, 2000, 2000, and the different models have different variables in them. So this first one is the country level variables and the individual variables without these uh, nonlinear variables. This one is without these educational proportional value uh, variables and then with these other nonlinear variables. Uh, and if we have more questions on that on Monday, I'll talk about that. <clears throat> but the most important thing here is what the results say. So most of the macro level variables are not significant. The only one that was close was per capita. And again, that's that prosperity theory uh, that wealth is, is related to uh, environmental concern. But if we look at the individual level, it is not only that, but it's wealth combined with if someone is well educated. Also, females tend to have higher levels of environmental concern. Here's post-materialist values is related. Relative income within country, um, years of education, knowledge about the environment. Perceived environmental quality. All these things are significant and lead to higher levels of um, higher levels of environmental concern, except for age. The older the respondent, the less environmentally concerned they were. And there is a, a, another theory that's implied in here, but it's not discussed, and it's called progressive socialization. That the younger 
you start learning about the environment, environmental concern, the stronger it's going to be by the time you get older. And, and even when you're younger, you're going to have stronger uh, concern for it. And that's also the subjective and the objective environmental um, uh, impact, uh, the post-materialist values theory that young people both feel objectively impacted by the environment and that they have to live in this environment for the next 50 or 60 years, but they subjectively feel that way because they've both been educated that way and they uh, have this sense of that this is an important value to have uh, and as part of being civilized and as part of being modern um, and as part of being a decent person as well. The nonlinearity, this equivalent income, uh, what this suggests here is that income, as it goes up, environmental concern goes up, and then at some point it inflects and goes back down. Uh, same with uh, years of education uh, is, is concave, meaning as uh, uh, education, um, again, uh, as education goes down, environmental concern goes down. Again, if you read this in the results, um, you'll see what they're talking about here. You also see that this is uh, this is an interaction term between um, GDP per capita, so um, personal levels of wealth and post-materialist values, and you see that's significant here in the last uh, model. So let's go over this, and this will explain a little bit more of some of these values. So I'll start where I left off. It says, overall, the so-called um, null model of the hierarchical linear, linear model, not shown here, indicates the 85% of total variance in observed individual level environmental concern is due to within country variance, meaning the differences between people inside their own country and not between countries themselves. Only the remaining 15% is due to between country variance. This means that the differences observed among individuals within a country are much larger than the differences observed between countries in terms of the average level of concern. On the macro level, 63% of the variance can be explained by a single factor, the per capita uh, it's price parity GDP. On the individual level, only 16% of the variance can be explained by all of our micro level determinants. Thus, the between country differences are relatively well explained by differences in wealth. However, the reasons for the differences in concern among individuals in any given country remain relatively unclear. And they go on to talk here in the discussion and conclusion about which theories are correct. So it goes on. Our multi-level analysis of the ISSP 93 and 2000 um, data demonstrates that individuals' concern for the environment varies between countries and within countries. The within country differences are much larger than the between country differences. The between country differences are best explained by the country's wealth as measured by the purchasing power adjusted per capita GDP. Hence, on average, Populations in richer countries have higher levels of environmental concern than inhabitants of poorer nations. So that is a little bit of support for the prosperity theory. <clears throat> the single wealth indicator explains 65% of the observed between country differences. This finding supports the prosperity hypothesis and argues against the globalization hypothesis or the post-materialism hypothesis. However, individuals' environmental concern does not depend, only depend on the macro context. So they're saying, look, the macro data has confirmed the prosperity theory. The micro data confirmed both this global theory of cultural value systems and, and the spread of global environmental concern and also the subjective and objective definitions that were contained in the most post-materialism values. That's why it's so fascinating that in certain circumstances one of these hypotheses and theories is correct and in the other circumstances the other two are correct. <clears throat> so it goes on to say, thus environmental concern depends on the relative income position within the country. So where you're at, if you're wealthy inside your country, your middle class, Instead of the country's individual wealth itself. Individuals who live in a relatively high income household as measured by the deviation from the country's mean income report higher concern for the environment than individuals and households with relatively lower income. In addition, this individual effect confirms the prosperity assumption which states that individuals' total concern or total willingness to pay for environmental quality increases with income. Furthermore, concern for the environment also depends on individuals' post-materialistic attitudes. So both are happening. Post-materialists express more concern for the environment than materialists. 
Moreover, individuals' environmental concern also depends on their education, knowledge about the environment, and the perceived environmental burden. However, we also have to point out that the 26 countries that participated in the ISSP are not a random sample of all nations. So it's limited mostly to wealthy, wealthy countries. Specifically, two-thirds of them are members of the OECD. That's the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, which are mostly developed countries like the United States, Germany, France, Great Britain, and only one-third are developing nations. The select selectivity should be kept in mind when attempting to generalize the macro-level findings. However, the country-specific samples are random samples, and the individual-level results presented should be fairly robust, meaning you can believe what you see in these countries. We can't generalize it to the whole world, but we can say it for these countries. <clears throat> they go on to suggest, investigations of environmental concern often ask whether and to what extent this concern relates to environmental behavior. So one of the things they're saying, big deal, you have all these people who say they're willing to do something in the environment. I find a lot of people who say they're willing to do charity work. They don't do it. Remember we talked about the hand-washing survey and the differences between their behavior and the religion survey. So one of the things they're trying to figure out is this connected to environmental behavior. They say studies on the individual level are rather pessimistic in this regard and show that environmental concern translates into behavior only if the behavior is not cost-intensive. So people talk a big show and they don't do anything. What a, what a surprise. As for example in the case of recycling, more likely curbside recycling. More costly actions such as saving energy and choosing public transport, transport, which is not just costly, but this is an invasion of people's personal privacy and space, and also is a marker of lower class behavior in life, and most people don't like the stigma of it, and depend more on material incentives and on pro-environmental attitudes. However, in democracies, a high level of environmental concern should translate into more pro-environmental governmental regulations. Voters with high environmental concern should support political parties that favor ecological policies and governmental regulations should therefore be more accepted in countries with higher levels of environmental concern. Economic development and wealth are, of course, related to high levels of production and should thus create higher absolute levels of energy consumption and accompanying CO2 emissions as well. However, green countries should have higher energy efficiency. This assumption is supported by our data, see figure four, the correlation between the average environmental concern expressed by a country's residents and its CO2 emissions per million US dollars uh, is negative 0.38 and statistically significant at the 10% level. In other words, the higher the environmental concern, the lower the CO2 emissions per unit of goods and services pronounced. What they're trying to suggest here is that if you have a higher level of environmental concern, people are more likely to pressure politicians into taking environmental positions or states or companies, and that you will see lower levels of CO2. So the level of environmental awareness leads to policy, and that's part of what they found. Now, to go on lastly, To sum up, it says, however, they suggest the level of environmental concern of a society in fact does influence environmental behavior, thus the maintenance or even increase of environmental concern seems to be a crucial component for environmental protection. So there's a lot of things going on there. Let me fix the camera. And keep in mind some of the things we said on the chart here. But again, one of the things you want to keep in mind is that Many times these theories are oppositional, they're in conflict with each other, they take different views, they have different concepts, they operationalize concepts differently, but in many cases they are all three correct in, depending on the specific situation. Like the post-materialist value in certain situations was correct, and the prosperity theory in certain situations was correct, and the global cultural theory was correct in certain areas. And what was interesting as well, they expanded it to talk about how environmental concern was connected to individual environmental behavior, as well as policy and other aspects. So you see not only that the individual study is what's important here, 
but how it extends and impacts other study, future studies, past studies. So again, that's one of the lessons I want people to take away from this and keep in mind some of these other areas I talked about, case, number of cases, what questions are asked, how the questions are worded, um, how was the sample taken, uh, was it phone or email or whatever it was. And keep that in mind when you're doing your second test and the survey questions. So that's all I got for today and I'll see everybody on Monday. Oprah was like the, you know, the, like the first um, um, multi-billionaire kind of like celebrity, the entertainment celebrity 